Hi, I'm Dan George. Welcome to my lockdown lecture. So I want to just talk a little bit about um, some of the projects that I work on um, at the moment. Um, so there are 14 World Engineering Grand Challenges, and they are things like reverse engineering the brain, engineering better medicines, and uh, the one that I work on, which is engineering the tools for scientific discovery. And I do that for uh, largely for radio astronomy, for radio telescopes so that uh, the scientists make the scientific discovery and I help develop the, the tools um, that, that allows them to do that. And specifically, I design what are called low noise amplifiers. So, um, so for radio astronomy, you want to try and capture as much of that beautiful cosmic signal as possible. Obviously, it's very, very far away, very faint. So you need to amplify that signal but you don't want to amplify anything else. You don't want to amplify any noise. So the atmosphere or any other interference, um, you just want to amplify the, the beautiful signal um, from the distant galaxy or star or whatever it is. And, um, and so I develop using different semiconductor technology, these amplifiers. So I've, I've printed out what, what an amplifier will look like. So this is, this is an amplifier. So the, the radio frequency signal comes in here from the radio telescope. It's then amplified along here and then comes out here into the rest of the receiver. And then this is just providing power to it basically. Um, and then, and this little black dot up here, you can see that, um, that's how big it is in reality. So this is a, a big blown up version and that's how big it is in reality. So these are the tiny things that, that me and my team design. And, um, and then they're cryogenically cooled. So we cool them to uh, 20 Kelvin or to uh, minus 253 degrees Celsius. Um, and like I say, we use different semiconductor technology to do that. Uh, we use what's called indium phosphide. We use gallium arsenide. So gallium arsenide chips are, um, or the type that might be in your mobile phone. So we design with the same technology, but different frequencies as well. And then we're looking at graphene as well. See if we can use graphene for, for future um, amplifiers as well. So, so I just want to tell you a little bit about two projects that I'm working on where I'm developing low noise amplifiers for the radio telescopes. The first one is called ALMA, which is the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. And this is uh, 5,000 meters above sea level on a plateau in Chile. Um, this has 66 antennas. So, you know, the old um, sort of sky dishes, that sort of thing, but just a bit bigger. Um, and they all work together, um, 66 of them, to open an entirely new window on radio astronomy and, and fundamental physics. Um, it works from 35 gigahertz to uh, 950 gigahertz. So just under a terahertz, so we're quite high frequency or in wavelengths that will be 8.6 millimeters to 0.3 millimeters. And it's, so, so what my team want to do is really push that semiconductor technology into the terahertz regions where we've never used it before for radio astronomy. So that's the big challenge for us. Um, but ALMA itself as a radio telescope is an incredible project to work on. The supercomputer that's used in ALMA operates um, at the highest altitude that a supercomputer has ever worked in the world. The images it produces are 10 times more detailed than the Hubble Space Telescope images. Um, 17 peta operations, so 17 trillion operations are needed every single second on that computer. So that makes it the fastest computer ever used on an astronomical site. And it's equivalent to billions of pounds worth of, of personal computers that would be needed to make those necessary calculations. Um, even just things like on the correlator, so the thing that brings all of the signals together from the 66 antennas, the correlator itself has, has um, 20 million welding points on it. Um, you know, they're, they're fabulous engineering challenges. Um, and all of this across the 66 antennas must work in exactly the same way, no matter what the temperature is. And that's pretty tricky on a plateau in Chile, 5,000 meters above sea level, when the temperature between day and night can be as much as 30 or 40 degrees. So, so they're, they're fabulous engineering challenges to work on. Um, a recent, fairly recent um, image that, uh, that the astronomers have, have taken using ALMA 
is of a, a quite a young star um, and it's about um, 1500 light years away from from Earth and um, and so they've, they've observed this star and then right at the center of this star um, they've detected salt just ordinary table salt sodium chloride glowing from this star and it's only with with telescopes like ALMA which are you know they're they're in the right place in terms of um, atmosphere um, they are they are such high precision antennas that that they can detect salt glowing from a star 1500 light years away and um and what i love about it is when when we found out about it the people who who worked on alma we were like wow that sounds amazing you know what what does it mean they were like, i don't know i like i'm not quite sure yet but that's what's really nice about it you know and it, it then it then goes okay now we've done that one why is it doing it and it takes you on to the the next scientific question which is which is brilliant um so that's alma that's one project I'm working on. The other one is called the Square Kilometre Array or the SKA. And this will be a, a series of antennas that are in Western Australia and in a remote area in South Africa. And they'll all be joined up, um, joined together. Um, and they will effectively make a square kilometres worth of collecting area. So if you imagine the big Lovell dish at Jodrell Bank Observatory, if that was a square kilometers worth, it would be sort of like that. Um, but instead of having one dish, you're gonna have hundreds of thousands of different types of dishes or aerials as well. Um, now it's currently being built, they're building the 10%. So this is sort of phase one, um, but when it's built, it will be 50 times more sensitive than any other radio instruments in the world and really will open it up new windows on fundamental physics, astrophysics and, and cosmology as well. Um, I think my favorite uh, fact about it is it will be so sensitive, it will be able to detect an airport radar like signal on a planet 10 light years away. So this is a super sensitive thing. Um, and it's, um, and it really is turning from an engineer's perspective, it's so interesting because it's turning on its head how we, how we design radio telescopes because now you're having to do it where you need to try and make huge amounts of these, create, design huge amounts of these telescopes rather than one or two or a few of them. You're into thousands of them. Um, and, and because of that, the, the amount of data it's going to generate is huge as well. So it's estimated that, that the low frequency part of, of these antennas will generate more than five times the global internet traffic just this one experiment is going to generate more than five times the global internet traffic. So, so if we could, when, when the whole of the SKA is built, if we could express the SKA data as a song taken in one day, <clears throat> download that song, that song would take two million years to play back. So uh, better be a good song, <laughs> but it's, you know, huge amounts of data. Um, transfers of one terabyte images are going to be needed every single minute and transferred around the world as well. So, so this is a really, really smart machine um, for the future. Um, but it's, but it's that, that data issue that's the real, like really nice challenge to work on as well. So, so I'm, I'm looking at the front end, the sort of amplification, but the data in the back end, if it was built now, we literally don't have the computing power in the world to to collect and store all of that raw data so you'd have to throw away up to 90 percent of the data and that's a tragic thing i think you know it's it just feels so wrong that you'd have to throw it away because we don't have that so so i'm i'm rooting for um quantum computing because i think that's gonna gonna really help us and that's that's some areas that need low noise amplifiers as well. So part of my team are looking at quantum computing now as well. So that's a, a really nice challenge as well. But they are huge challenges for us and they're certainly not gonna be um, uh, all solved in my lifetime. You know, they're gonna be new challenges. And so we need to make sure that we've got that next generation working on these amazing um, technological challenges and innovating where they need to innovate as well. So. So I, I, I feel really lucky to, um, to be able to, to work in a profession where I can look ahead and see the rising demand for, for the type of skills that I have. And, and I find it 
a really interesting challenge for engineers because we, we do have to work quite hard to attract people, um, girls, we've talked about girls in engineering before as well. Um, why do we have to do that? You know, how great would it be just to have an industry where, where young people are queuing up to join us in engineering, not because they're being cajoled or pestered into thinking that it's the right thing to do, but because they've known, they've always known how great the opportunities are in science, technology, engineering, mathematics. So, so society as a whole, including children, has, um, has a real understanding of what many professions do, such as medicine, because we've all had first-hand um, use of it at some point in our lives. So it's it's ironic that engineering is everywhere, but it's invisible because it's woven into the very fabric of everyday life. And as a consequence, many people do not know what engineers do. And why should they, if we aren't out there helping them to understand how amazing engineering is, how ingenious engineers are, how creative engineers are as well. And, and part of that um, success as well is that you don't succeed. So part of being ingenious and being creative as an engineer is that you don't succeed all the time as well. Um, we need to, to celebrate those failures of, and that's what we have all the time. If you're not innovating, you're, you need to fail in order to innovate. And, and as scientists and engineers, you have to innovate. So you, therefore you have to fail along the way. And that's fail fast and learn approach that I think we need to make sure that next generation of, of engineers and scientists um, have got as well. So, um, so my last um, picture for you is this one. The way to innovate is to get out of your comfort zone. Here's your comfort zone. And here's where the magic happens over here. So this is where you need to be. If you're an engineer or a scientist, you need to be over here. And in, in order to be over here, you need to be failing as well. And I think that's such an important message for, for all of us to take to the next generation. <laughs>